Thank you. If I'd known you were going to read all of that out, I might have said, no, I won't chair the session. Um, one thing that you didn't quite mention, which I think is relevant, and I said this to colleagues when I was asked to do this, which is my approach to the world has been very much about the social determinants of health, not about health care services. The pandemic has done at least two things. It's done several more, uh, but done two things to our understanding. One is uh, that we can't say it's social determinants of health or health care. It's clearly both. Uh, and they clearly need to be addressed together. Uh, no question. And the second thing that it did for those of us in high income or middle income countries is the idea, well, all that infectious disease business was all in the past. It's now all non-communicable disease. And suddenly an infectious disease pandemic had an unparalleled impact on society, the economy, the healthcare services, everything. So uh, it's a big shakeup in understanding. But having said that, what I do personally is about social determinants of health, not about primary health care. But I do think of primary health care as not only doing something very important, but it's an embodiment of values. It's an embodiment of what we think is important in society. So it's with that context, um, I'm not going to follow your lead and I'm not going to read out long introductions of the two speakers. Um, the best thing I can say about Renee Lowenson, if, from my point of view, is she's a good friend um, and we've worked together on social determinants of health um, since the early 2000s. Uh, she's passionately committed to the issue of equity uh, and in low income, middle income and high income countries. So, Renee, please. Thank you, Michael. Um, and thank you for not reading out a long introduction. <laughs> I was a bit overwhelmed by yours and I thought, how can I follow this? Um, I'm sharing screen. So can I ask, are you all able to see the screen? Yes, well, at least I can. Excellent. Okay. So um, thanks, colleagues. And, and, and I, I'm indeed very honored to share the platform with the two esteemed um, colleagues and with the folks from the Institute. So I appreciate the invitation. Um, so I, I, this panel is about equity in primary health care, but I actually want to argue that um, investing in comprehensive primary health care is investing in equity. And I'll explain why. And my focus is going to be on the East and Southern African region, although I think some of what I will say is more widely applicable. Um, so I think in our region, in East and Southern Africa, um, we have, you know, experience of both old and new equity challenges. The International Covenant on Economic and Social Rights, which was passed even before the primary health care Alma-Ata Accord, basically said that everybody has the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. Our countries have all ratified that covenant. But we have both historical and current inequalities in, in, living, in the living and working conditions that the covenant covered, um, as I've indicated there. And we now have a number of new challenges in our re region, for example, rising urbanization, very rapid rates of rising urbanization. We have growing commercial determinants, um, oxygenic environments, corporate practices in monocropping, for example, of biofuels that have changed food systems that affect nutrition. We do have rising levels and distribution of chronic conditions that are coexisting with communicable and other uh, challenges to health. And as you, as Michael has raised, we now have a, a massive attention on pandemics, but they've been around in epidemic form um, in our region for, for many years. And now the 
threats in growing threats of climate related changes. So as we're thinking about primary health care, we're also thinking about how we address some of these equity challenges. And what are the statistics that we've gathered across our region tell us? And the first thing that's really, and I don't have the time to go into them because this has to be quite a short presentation, but you'll find them all on the Equinet website, is that, is that economic activity and growth in our region does not automatically translate into health improvement, and particularly not into equity and health improvement. For example, we know that in certain parts of our region, in Tanzania and Zimbabwe and other parts of our region, areas of very high crop surpluses are also areas of high malnutrition. Um, because the food is being exported from those regions. Or we've also found in work that we've done in, 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 in Southern Africa, in, such as in Mozambique, that mining sectors that are contributing hugely to growth in gross domestic product are actually areas with, of districts where there have been weaker poverty declines and epidemic outbreaks. So, you know, there's not an automatic translation in, in, in this underlying context. And, and, and in fact, we realize that we're seeing rising urban risk that's changing the old rural urban inequality with new levels of urban um, risk and morbidity, such as is shown in that graph on obesity, female obesity, which is higher in urban areas now than in rural areas, but also inequalities within areas that we very poorly assess because we tend to look at areas as a kind of cluster as a whole. Um, Having said that, with these challenges, what we do know is that primary care services, and I'm not talking about primary health care yet, but primary care services have greater pro-poor benefit. Um, that, and you can see it in that graph, for example, from Tanzania, but the same graph has been found in other parts of our region, that the lower the level of the system, the more the benefit to the poorer socioeconomic groups. And that falls away as you go up the referral system, including for, for um, uh, public sector services. But what's particularly important about comprehensive primary health care, and I use the word comprehensive purposively, is that it does address not just the absence of, well, of disease, but also well-being. It puts health as a fundamental human right. It acts upstream on social determinants of health in all areas of comprehensive public health. And it puts communities and local health workers at the center. And it's those features that I really just want to put a little bit of attention to. In our region, we have seen, um, you know, since independence in our countries, the positive impact on coverage, on health outcomes of participatory approaches, of growing health literacy, connecting communities with health center committees to, to, to act on health issues and, and plan their services, and indeed of community health workers that have formed a vital bridge um, between services and communities, including in detecting pandemic out epidemic outbreaks. And there's some of the photographs there are from Zambia, from um, other parts of our region about the kind of issues that health systems have been able to energize through that. But I think what we're seeing now and what we've participated is a widening to new challenges. So for example, we are working in mining areas where we're connecting unions, workers and communities to link on the, the wider health impacts of mining in their areas, on their districts, through doing health impact assessments, through getting prior informed consent on processes that might be harmful to health, um, including on, on, on the long-term processes after mines close and creating health literacy for wider public health issues in those communities. We've also worked with informal sector communities to, work, to carry out their local assessments on the environments for health, on pollution tracking, and indeed on looking at services delivery in their area and, and how they respond to these issues. So I think that this, this idea of cross-sectoral action and the way the health system interacts with it um, is not always starting from within the health system, but strong primary healthcare systems have been able to connect and work with other groups and have have responded to them seeing health as an issue. So for example, in Kenya, the Slum Youth Federation, which was linked by Slum Dwellers International, collected data on shelter, sanitation, water, infrastructure, health services, social and commercial facilities, and used this with cooperation from local health workers and others to negotiate and be given tenure rights by the city council and to upgrade their own living um, and infrastructural conditions with obvious health impact. Um, and also to build skills in youth and, and enterprise around construction and, and, and leadership in, in that way. And I have to say our region is 
literally bristling with local technology innovation. We saw it during the pandemic, but we've seen it for many years in the ventilated pit latrines, in water systems, in local foods, and so on. The primary healthcare systems, local systems are able to connect with um, and, and take advantage of in improvements of health. And indeed, during the pandemic, um, we saw the benefit of these kind of investments where citizen scientists were able to uh, use open source technology, di digital tools to, to track um, communities that were not receiving services or, or to look for particular problematic areas to report for surveillance, to connect and engage on, on, on health service outreach, but also to form solidarity networks to provide food and shelter um, to vulnerable groups, including migrant groups, and, and indeed to make connections between local food producers and communities when supply chains were broken during lockdowns. All of this has significant impact on health outcomes for, for, the, for the communities that would otherwise be isolated and vulnerable from top-down approaches. So I'm gonna move on and I want to just reflect a little bit on how do we energize these kinds of approaches? What kind of national systems do we need? And my experience is that we need to update our public health laws. Um, we realized in Zimbabwe, and I think the same is true for many countries in our region, that the 1924 Public Health Act that we had um, was strong, but it didn't reflect rights. It didn't reflect primary health care as Alma Arta said it. It wasn't affirmative or proactive. So we actually initiated a process to revise the act, to implement some of these changes, to include mechanisms for community involvement, for public information, to recognize cadres such as community health workers, traditional health workers, et cetera, um, and to bring them into harmony with state roles, to create a duty on all actors, including corporate actors, to prevent harm to health, and to bring on board in the law tools that the minister could now um, uh, set for particular sectors, such as health impact assessments or control measures or codes of practice, and indeed to include a provision for the health minister with the minister of finance to, to create new public health funds to take advantage of some of the innovative financing tools that we, be, we were beginning to develop to support public health. I'm going to move on then to what is the other, the other key area, and, I've, um, and I think I've mentioned it, which is adequate progressive public financing. Um, this chart is from um, some of the countries in our region and everything on the right hand side is more equitable. And it's essentially public financing, mandatory insurance or, or tax financing. And what we've seen in our region is that as public financing falls because of neoliberal policy, structural adjustment programs ex expanded to other areas. So we've actually seen the funding which goes to primary care level and primary health care also falling. In fact, in our region analysis we did um, quite recently was only two of our countries out of the 16 have actually met the Abuja commitment of 14% of their domestic budgets going to health. Seven of our countries have had out of pocket spending as a result, which was above the 20% that WHO thinks is essential to avoid catastrophic expenditures, um, which are critical for equity. And we have a high reliance on external funding for primary health care in many of our countries. The graph that you see there is the amount of domestic financing versus total financing for primary, for, for primary health care expenditure. And you'll see most of our countries, it's less than 50% is domestic. So in essence, it means we're highly dependent on external financing, which is often vertical, often unpredictable. Indeed, during the pandemic, the kind of things we then had to quickly shift money to were for the sort of prevention, control, surveillance, testing, the more public health measures that we had underfinanced prior to the pandemic that would have been financed had we been investing domestically in comprehensive primary health care. Now, I, I think this implies action at the national level, but it also implies action at the global level. And we're doing work on the tax losses, which are coming from the current global tax rules that lead to the kind of loss of public revenues for our health systems. Um, the AU ministers of finance have raised this, that the kind of tax system that we currently have where multinationals are taxed in the countries that they're registered rather than where they generate the wealth in our countries is actually leading to about 312 billion in losses annually from such practices, including the illicit financial flows that could be a significant boost to public revenue, including health budgets. And part of the consequence of this is a move towards target-driven financing. 
that often doesn't fund, is very facility-based and often doesn't fund the kind of comprehensive primary health care initiatives that we that I've that I've talked about earlier. And indeed, research that we did, participatory research in five countries in our region with local communities, health center committees, and local health workers, when asked what they would like to fund, they all talked about the kind of things I talked about earlier, prevention and management of chronic conditions, health and education, community outreach, et cetera. So the health system, the local health system want to fund these sorts of areas, but the movement in financing is moving towards the more biomedical disease-based intervention. So we need to resist this, both through our tax systems within countries and globally. So in summary, investing in comprehensive primary health care is an investment in equity, particularly when we invest in the social determination of health and in holistic approaches in our health systems. It means for the current challenges we're facing, we need to go beyond traditional actors, move into area-based approach and work with innovative approaches and new communities to address these new challenges. When we do that, we are more able to pivot to support emergencies like pandemics, and indeed climate emergencies. And community evidence is a critical resource for equity of these kinds of processes. But to do this, we have to look at the kind of national and global level processes that enable equity gain. Updating our public health laws, ensuring what is funded integrates local comprehensive primary health care priorities, improving domestic progressive public health financing, and addressing tax injustices that are leading to significant losses in tax revenue in our countries. Um, if anything I've said is of interest, please do visit the Equinec website and you'll find a significant body of information there. But I'm also happy to take any comments and address any questions. Thank you, Michael, and back to you. Renee, thank you so much. Um, speaking personally, everything you said is of interest and you covered a great deal in 10 minutes. So that's amazing. And you also, you did it in a very nice way, but um, you made clear that focusing on primary health care does not mean ignoring social determinants of health by any means. So for all of that, thank you. And for everyone in the um, webinar, if you could save your questions till after we've had the second presentation, and then we'll have a general discussion. And um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sentayehu. Uh, we've not been friends for 20 years, but maybe we can start the clock now and <laughs> look forward to the next 20 years. Uh, he's trained in medicine and public health, been very much involved in all kinds of government and related activities in Ethiopia uh, and in USAID, is that right, um, as well. So please, 10 minutes. Good. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Michael, uh, for the introduction. So let me check whether you are, you know, you are seeing my slides, is that right? Yep, we can. Good, thank you very much. Uh, so now I'm trying to give you some know, uh, experience I personally have uh, in my different capacities on uh, primary uh, health care in Ethiopia. So I, I just want to kind of connect to this topic of uh, primary health care and equity. So, you know, the first thing that comes to our mind when we talk about this, uh, the health status, the difference in health status between urban rural dwellers between uh, women and men, uh, between educated, non-educated, and so on. The other parameter which comes to our mind is, this is because of one of the reasons is economic reasons, and that may be associated with fair chance of having economic opportunities. And the other thing is, we are having these differences in health status because of our in different social gradients. Where is our social status in the community? So usually tied up with poverty. So now I'm trying to kind of share an experience uh, of you know Ethiopia, how we are trying to address in the last maybe 20 years in which I was so involved. Uh, Sir Michael, if you allow me, I want to use your word. You know, I listened some six or seven years ago 
I heard you saying that the opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. So the connection of primary health care and equity is for me is about justice. Justice in the community. Empower the community to have that social justice by having health equity. And the critical issue is the social determinants of health, which are non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. And my presentation will be focusing on how we are going to address the upstreams and the wider determinants of health, not focusing on the primary care. So in Ethiopia, or not only in Ethiopia, but across the globe, you know, the upstream approach starts from policies, from legal frameworks, and then different strategies within the sector, beyond the sector. And we are going to have also, you know, we are having different programs and how we are going to cascade or operationalize these two individuals and group of people as a community. So I just want to have my presentation in a kind of the upstream social determinants covering around what is happening around policy and legal framework in Ethiopia, at least for the last 20 years. What are the strategies we have been following to address equity in general? What are the, some of the programs, not all of them, trying to address that? So, you know, there are a lot of participants in this uh, webinar from Ethiopia. They can add also more, you know, experience in the chat box among the participants. But I will try to start by what is our constitution is saying about health in general, how it's trying to address equity. So in our constitution, there are different articles. One is the right approach. You see a number of articles from the right to privacy, about the right of freedom in religion, in expression of opinion, rights of children, rights of women. You mentioned about rights of environment, about rights of labor and you know, cultural issues and so on. There are health issues mentioned in the constitution, recognizing as a right issue in Ethiopia. And furthermore, the constitution has objectives. So it tries to you know, address health from the economic objective of the constitution, from the social aspect, again, from the environmental aspect. And when it also tries to address, we are following federal system, what is the role of you know, the federal government, the regional government in addressing health, including health emergencies. So this is one of the upstream agenda for health and equity in general. So the strategies we have been following for the last 20 years, I'm not going to dwell much along all these years, but I'll start from the 1993, where the first health policy comes into picture, followed by the health sector strategy in 1995, which stipulate about six tier system. Later on, the health sector development plan came up with four tier system and healthcare financing to make sure that the health facilities, the front you know, uh, line uh, service delivery points, how to retain you know, incomes, how to also engage the communities and the likes. And then HSDP2 comes into the picture with the issue of you know, essential health service package the first essential health service package in Ethiopia was determined in 2005 to indicate these are the essential services that should be available to all, regardless of education status, regardless of where they are living, regardless of their ethnic group. And the health extension program also was, you know, the inception was in 2002 and in 2003 it was launched and it was trying to address the issue around, you know, children and, and also mothers trying to address the health disparity among different groups. And then in the HSDP3, the focus was you know, about focusing on the tier system, more decentralization. It's about also organizing the central level, the federal agencies to support the entire health system. And then HSDP4 is trying to bring the health development army. And the last two HSDP, including the current one, the current one is focusing on transformation agenda. As you know, one of the transformation agenda in HSTP1, Health Sector Transformation 1, which was from 2016 up to 2020, and now the current one from 2021 until 2025 around that, equity and quality is the main agenda. So the strategy which was also endorsed is trying to address access 
for health services, leadership, governance, and so on. But this looks like that health focus things, but there are also other areas that we are trying to address through the health extension program. As you know, the health extension program has you know, a world transformation concept in which multi-sectoral collaboration, multi-sectoral engagement is incorporated. For example, you know, nutrition sensitive agriculture, how the health extension program need to align with the agricultural health workers to make sure that there is a nutrition sensitive agriculture going on. So about also uh, the environmental issues, how the environment can be kept clean. It also talks about, you know, a kind of rodents and so on. So this, the health extension program has evolved from 20, you know, 2002 until recently with different areas trying to address equity from the health perspective, women and children, the essential health service package, health extension program for pastoral setting because the context of the pastoralist you know, livelihood is completely different, different from the agrarian and urban. And the issue of urban poor, and now the concept of family health team to focus on households with low you know, uh, health profile and low economic status and reach out through the family health team is another you know, agenda that have been entertained. After evaluating the health extension program journey of more than nearly two decades, then the new health extension program optimization roadmap launched last year. You know, then the focus of that program is not only on health, primary health care, it's also about addressing social economic, social cultural determinants. Sir Mike has addressed it. They should be addressed simultaneously. So it tries to address multi-sectoral engagement, partnership, and most importantly, political commitment, equity, universal health coverage, primary health care, whatever, these are political choices that you know, the government or whoever you know, trying to lead this country should put in place. So the health extension program, the new roadmap is cognizant of that, is calling for multi-sectoral collaboration, more stronger partnership with civic society organizations, private sector, academia, you name it. It's a whole of government, whole of society approach. So that is the only way to preach to universal health coverage in a progressive manner. So I will try to cite two programs that are recognized by most Ethiopians in the, you know, in the, in, in the public sector, especially the Sakota Declaration. This is a commitment of the government about addressing nutrition in a multi-sectoral manner. So the drivers for this is, there was a study on cost of hunger, which showed that Ethiopia is losing 16.5, one six percent of its GDP annually, about 55 billion bar. The currency exchange was less than 25 by then. So that is a huge loss for the economy. The demographic dividend can only be dividend if you start investing on nutrition as part of early childhood development. Addressing undernutrition is not only about addressing health. It's about addressing sustainable development. So we have witnessed that in order to have a sustainable de development, you need to have peace. Without peace, you cannot achieve you know, equitable health you know, uh, coverage. So different sectors gathered. It was launched in the presence of the deputy prime minister. So multi sectoral engagement. It has been in the picture for since 2016. And now it has started with fewer around 40 waradas. Now it has scaled up to 20 waradas and the journey will continue. The other multi-sectoral program Ethiopia is entertaining, I believe in other countries as well, is a one wash program. The driver for this is the economic and social good is water. So availing adequate clean water is an agenda that need to help us address equity in all parameters, but especially on health. So based on this journey, so what was our you know, Ethiopian demography and you know, uh, surveys was telling us? So I, I, I just, there are a number of studies. I want to just cite two of them for the interest of time. So if you look at one of the research, I've also indicated the source over here about contraceptive utilization among adolescents. So I will leave it for your reading in detail, but the message at the end of the day, this article is telling us 
to address social economic and education status to be improved among adolescents so that they will utilize contraceptives efficient contraceptives effectively you know the parameters is about whether they are coming from you know a wealthy household whether you know they are attending schools and so on so it's not directly yes, but the recommendation is to address social economic status to improve their uptake around you know family planning another example from another article is about antenatal care you know maternal mortality is very high antenatal care has a huge you know impact around that so if you look at this again there is disparity different across different you know uh, gradients of uh, social status if you look at this in 2005 ethiopian demographic and you know health survey the gap between the poorest and the richest was 45 percent point difference but it is narrowed to 37 percent point difference in 2016. now the question is this is only an 8% point narrowing over 10 years. So is it enough to address equity? I think the answer is obvious, it's not. So the agenda that was discussed in Health Sector Transformation Plan 2 was, so what shall we do next? So the agenda is we're dwelling much around, you know, district transformation, Warada transformation from health sector point of view. But the Waradas that have a better status, they showed that status because of multi-sectoral engagement. So the agenda in HSTP2 is about multi-sectoral Warada transformation. What does that mean? So why we are interested on that? So challenges at household level requires a different approach. We cannot address equity on the way we do in the past. Business as usual doesn't work. And if you look at the third bullet, the equity gaps observed in addressing services, for example, not satisfactory narrowing. In some areas, the services for richers is getting you know, bigger, but for those, those who are in a poor status are even getting low and low. And the other driving issue is the pressure coming from the use budget, unless otherwise we put a right you know, uh, measure, whatever we are doing in the health sector is going to, is going to be you know, uh, canceled out by social routes, by you know, different revolutions, especially from the youth. We have witnessed that here in Ethiopia. And we need to also empower the community. And the other critical element is we can have development for a short period of time. But in order to sustain it, it should be inclusive. It should be mindful of the environment. And we need to work around peace. So how can we do about that? So the first thing is to agree on the principle that households are the center of transformation. Whatever we are doing at the national level, whatever we are deciding at the parliament and so on cannot transform us. What transform us is what's going to happen at household level. Ethiopia may have a double digit growth. If it's not, that is not you know, addressed in an equitable manner, if you are not addressing the social economic determinants, the social cultural determinants, we are not sustaining it. We need to have that principle in common and we need to work on that as well. So that's, you know, uh, let me, I think the time is against me. So the, when the households are changing, that will drive into countrywide change. So then the other important element, I'm just uh, running for the interest of time, is how are we going to look at our measurement. So the recommendation was, it's about improved livelihood. So we are talking about household transformation. How do you define a household transformed? There should be food security. A household need to be considered transformed if they have food security, food on the table, decent income, job creation, and the income at the district level. And the other thing is that the living condition, the physical condition of their house, the utilities, water, electricity, including access to information, the technologies that reduces hardship for girls, for women, and the likes, and the environment that's conducive to live on. And the other parameter to improve the households is education, adult literacy. When education, it should have also quality. In, in Ethiopia, sometimes you may find a fourth grader student who struggles to read who struggles to do mathematics, you know, simple basic mathematics. 
girls' education are very critical. The other thing to transform household is life expectancy, especially focusing on premature adult days, child you know, reduction of child mortality, malnutrition, and so on, the likes. So this too is about early childhood development. The Ethiopian Human Capital Index is around 38%. That means you know, a child who is now four years age, when he or she are you know, reached the age of 80, she can or he can only explore 38% of his or her capacity because of the, uh, you know, the social, economic, social, cultural, or social determinants of us. Because of lack of you know, education, they are not staying in school adequately, school dropouts and so on. Their nutrition status is very poor. They are having struggling adequate water. They are getting a lot of illnesses, school drops out and the likes. And, and all of this is about preventing ill health. So finally, I want to say that equity in general and health equity in particular should be a source of our solidarity, a source of our togetherness, especially for us locally. You know, in Ethiopian context, we are trying to pick up inequalities and we point out that for to be a point of differences, but rather it should have been our solidarity to solve it together. And I think Dr. Rene has said it well, the equity gain from comprehensive primary health care calls national, local, international attention. I will leave you with a word from Martin Luther King some 60 years ago. I'll read it out for you. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single government of destiny. What affects one directly affects all indirectly. Thank you. And thank you very much. Um, and now we've got a little bit of time for discussion. Um, uh, I think one question that I'd like to ask both of you, uh, um, and uh, you in a way touched on it, Dr. Sentayehu, with your example of undernutrition. And, but uh, Renee, let me start with you. Um, if we need to get cross government action, uh, how do we get departments of government whose primary responsibility is not health to think about the health impact? Um, it's something we're always wrestling with. Why should, uh, how do we convince a minister? And I'll come to you in a moment, Dr. Sentayehu, about the nutrition example. But how do we get a minister whose responsibility is for pensions, for social protection, for education? Uh, to how do we convince them they should be concerned about health, not just primary health care, but including primary health care? Renee? Yeah, that's a tough question to answer in a minute or two. <laughs> um, I think partly the answer is technical in the sense that we are, we are basically framing our sectors in these very siloed budgets and performance monitoring systems. And we need to reform the, the state tools that we use to promote cross-sectoral um, procurement, tendering, budgeting, et cetera. So there's a fair amount of technical work and countries that have done that sort of technical work in some of their social protection funds in, in Latin America, or I think Rwanda has done some stuff on that, have actually seen some shifts in the kind of communication and cooperation. But I think the other part of the answer is also political in that um, the demand for it the, uh, and I think part of what Dr. Sintayo was referring to and what I was talking about is that the demand for this kind of cross-sectoral stuff is felt most strongly at the local level. And, but, and local government is responsive to it uh, greater, to a greater degree than central government. So in a sense, it's a political thing about how, how accountable are our systems for what is being demanded at the base where people do need to work together. Uh, where mayors, for example, have created some of this cross-sectoral co collaboration to a greater degree than some of the central government actors have by bringing people together. So I think it's a kind of an issue of the way our, 
our, our systems are structured. And my final point on it is part of the problem that I see in our region is a lot of public policy is being made in private spaces. You know, the, the influence of private commercial actors has become quite profound uh, in the East and Southern African region, as I think it has in many other regions of the world. And so I think one of, one of the um, local community actors said, we, we can actually make these changes, but we can't do it if we are not party to the discussions of public policy and so on. So I think we need to kind of really get to our parliamentarians to, to bring things into public domain that are currently being discussed in private domain. Right up front, you know, at the start of when things are discussed, in the procurement, in the tendering processes, in the licensing processes, you know, it really means going quite, quite up, uh, quite upstream in the way our states work. And 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 I, I, you know, we have experiences from other countries where doing this does help, does help to, you know, to make this kind of difference at at at, uh, at regions within countries. I'm not sure we have, other than these sort of social protection funds, we have very good experiences um, at national or international level. I don't think our international agencies, for example, are cooperating in that kind of way. Um, so that's a kind of a, a potted answer to a complex question. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Santiago, in calling on you, your response, could you also consider, you said in your presentation, put households at the center of everything. And how, if at the same time, we're trying to get cross government action, how do we put households at the center and get community involvement? Thank you for the question. I think from the, the Ethiopian experience, we have witnessed that um, it's doable using the health extension program. So the health extension program, when it is initially designed, it has identified 16 packages categorized into four components. So the first one is about family health. So under family health, there are prioritized interventions, scientifically proven, like immunization, antenatal care services, uh, nutrition related services and the likes. These are packaged under family health approach to bring these services closer to the household. So the other is disease prevention and control, the high burden diseases like TB, HIV, malaria, deadly non-communicable diseases are also coming into the picture. Some of the respondents, I mean, the attendants also asked that question. And, uh, and then the third component is about environment. So how can we keep the environment? How can we keep the household safe? How can food handling happen in, in, you know, at the household level? How can you know, water can be kept safe at the point of use. People, they may collect the water maybe some 20, 15 kilometers away from home, but after they're bringing it at home, they don't know how to keep it safe and so on. So this has been you know, included in the extension program. And the platform of delivering this is, it has three approaches. One is a, a travel to households. So the health extension worker, they are assigned to a certain localities they are expected to travel 50% of their time to households to educate this, to learn the problems that the, their community is facing. The other 50% is to remain in their health post and wait for the clients to come. And the third component is a kind of schedule level outreach services to schools and the likes. So this was the, the approach, but this approach is different in different regions. So the difference arises from one, leadership. When the leadership are truly really committed and support the health extension workers, it shows results. The second one, you know, dedicating resources by the district, you know, uh, health offices and the likes. So again, it goes about giving attention to, to that area. And the third, you know, uh, area of engagement is also to try to call partnership and also support from the other sector as well. But the problem is when this program is getting mature and when the politicians see that, you know, this is getting momentum, there are side activities coming into the picture. So the extension workers were asked to collect revenue, 
the edge extension workers, they are asked to participate in agricultural tasks and so on, they become overstretched. And in some places, they were kind of also, uh, you know, involved in some political you know, areas and so on. So keeping this balance, when something is getting momentum in the community, there will be an attention by others to use it. And at that junction, you lose your focus. So that is a challenge. But otherwise, the health extension program, which has trained more than 35 or nearly 40,000 uh, know, health, you know, health extension workers, was able to reach a significant number of people. And again, below the health extension workers, there is a community organized movement. Initially, the idea was kind of to support the health extension workers in mobilizing the community. But in some places, you know, it was a kind of taken away by the politics. It's not getting a lot of momentum, but in other places, it's working well. So it's doable, but it's doable when you have community health workers nearer to the households. Thank you. Um, Renee, let me come back to you. Uh, the, a general question is about hierarchy of needs. Is that something that resonates with you? So the specific question that was asked was, can we really think about technical innovations in primary health care when people don't have clean water or enough food? I mean, in one way, um, Dr. Santayahu addressed this. His two examples were new, under nutrition and one wash uh, specific programs. Um, is your response to a question like that, yeah, we can wait or we do it all together or what? I mean, how do you think about the order in which things are addressed? Yeah, I. Um... Am I, am I on? Yeah. Um, innovation in water and food is part of technical innovation in primary health care. So I'm, you know, why, why are we not doing that? I, I think part of the problem that, you know, we, we did, inter, we did um, sessions with young people in different cities in our region. And one of the things they said to us was that you know, we're no longer going to get jobs. We have to be entrepreneurs. We have to enterprise if we want to earn an income. And part of the way they want to be entrepreneurial is to actually do local technology innovation, is to, is to satisfy basic needs through what they can do, whether it's building housing or sorting out last mile water storage systems or solid waste management. I mean, there's a range of these kind of things going on that all have impact on health. The problem we found, and by the way, many of these things are also potentially green technologies that could help with climate change um, management, although you know, climate change is an issue that's globally generating inequality, so local solutions are only part of the story. But part of the problem we've seen is that we have, they have almost no state funding. There's very little venture capital, private finances, or funding large, often foreign enterprises. And that even our universities and our professionals find it really difficult to get the investment in research and development, proof of concept finance funding, venture capital funding, even internet access funding, to be able to, to solve some of these basic problems of water and sanitation, or, or, or of food technology processing. So what we're seeing is this explosion of one-off systems in different places in our region, rather than scaling up what works through our banks or through our funders in our region. And I, I, I think our states have some liability, but I also think that we, we need, and I, I, I saw there's somebody from the African Development Bank in this session. I mean, this is the kind of thing where we need to have large funding blending with local processes. Um, uh, WHO, for example, had a really interesting um, innovation hackathon for people all over the region to talk about what they could do around supporting water needs during the pandemic and food needs during the pandemic. Lots of people came up with really interesting ideas about what could be done through local technologies to complement public infrastructure because public infrastructure has failed to deliver. Um, while public resources should go into these infrastructures, so, so I, I, I just don't see it as like, oh, well, you know, we have to wait to be 
I think this was a World Bank argument, you know, don't, don't invest in university education. Back in the days of structural adjustment, don't invest in university education. You should invest in primary school because what you should focus on is basic needs. But that's nonsense. We're a society that needs to invest across the full spectrum. We need to address these basic issues, but we also need to turn our population. We need to capacitate our population to innovate around science and research and development and technology. And we need to deal with the intellectual property systems that are actually preventing us from also doing the biotech that's needed within our health systems. So my, my answer is it's not an either or. Um, and I completely appreciate the question, but I do think that there is an, an awful lot that can be done for local people to, to improve food security if they get adequate support. Thank you. And I didn't have many tasks as a chair, but one of them was to try and finish on time. And I'm about to fail in that one. So let, let me just comment briefly um, before we stop on what we've heard from two brilliant presentations. Thank you. Um, one thing that we only just touched on was measurement actually having indicators of progress, which of course is vitally important. Um, it, it was a theme running through it. A second, uh, and I, I agree, Renee, that we shouldn't be thinking of either or. Um, so do we do this before we do that? No, we do them at the same time. Uh, I agree with you completely. Uh, we should be getting women uh, to be have equity of access to tertiary education at the same time that we're trying to deal with universal primary education. I, I agree completely. It's not either or. Um, and dealing with these things at the same time is vital. Another which came through both presentations is it's not local or central action, it's both. Uh, central government obviously is vital, but local community action is also absolutely vital. And then uh, you both referred to a whole set of challenges that face us. Uh, and primary health care has to be part of facing those challenges. Climate change, inequalities, social and economic inequalities, peace, all viola, all um, the huge issues that we set the context for what we do, but also impact on health equity um, and are absolutely vital. And we need to think uh, that we can actually address those issues. And the political one of how we get on the political agenda, well, there are no simple answers to that question, but I think having good examples where it's worked um, is one way to advance the case. I'm very grateful to both of our speakers. Um, thank you to our hosts, the International Institute for Primary Healthcare uh, Equity in Ethiopia. And, uh, and thank you to all participants. And can I hand back to you uh, to say goodbye? Yeah, thank you, uh, Sir Michael. Thank you everyone for being here. I just dropped uh, a link in the chat box. So for anyone interested to visit the Institute, uh, you can just visit our website and learn more about uh, our initiatives. Thank you all the speakers and moderators and everyone for collaborating on this. Uh, stay tuned for our next webinar series. Have a wonderful evening, morning and uh, day. Bye. Bye, thank you very much. Good. Bye, thank you. <laughs>